name is Dr. Simon Agger, chiropractor and clinical nutritionist. I'm here today to tell you about nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, they're very common. They're used um, throughout a lot of the Western world. Um, we're talking about Advil. We're talking about aspirin. We're talking about ibuprofen, indomethacin, naproxen, uh, and Aleve. Many of the things that you can buy over the counter and also get prescribed um, by your medical doctor. Uh, there's definitely a place for these drugs. They're helpful in taking down inflammation, but I want you to understand exactly what they do in the body, how they work, and what some of the side effects are, and then talk about alternatives that you can use to them to give you the best information, the most current research, so that you can make the best informed choices for your health. So first of all, what are they? Um, we just covered that, uh, uh, talking about uh, Advil, um, uh, naproxen, ibuprofen. They're very common. Most of you know what those are. Uh, they've been around for a while. How do they work? Well, they inhibit this enzyme here called cyclooxygenase. And that's a big word, but what it means is that they prevent the arachidonic acid converting into prostaglandins. Uh, thromboxanes and uh, prostacyclins, which are a group of molecules known as prostanoids. And that's where the main therapeutic event comes. And this happens right at the cellular level um, when you are doing this. And one of the problems with this is, although it takes inflammation down, it's not selective on which prostaglandins that it shuts out or closes down. And uh, we know that PGA2 is probably one of the worst uh, prostaglandins because this prostaglandin will actually um, stimulate pain going from the site of the injury up to the brain uh, so you get the feeling and the experience of pain. But it has no selectivity on this and it will go through the, the prostaglandin 1, the prostaglandin 3, the thromboxanes and some of the other prostanoids. Um, and they can be uh, debilitating to our health if that occurs over a long period of time. But that's what they're doing and that's how they work. And they work very well. Um, the aspirin will inhibit the granular sites on the inside of the vascular walls. That's why some doctors like to use it for thinning blood uh, and preventing against um, cardiovascular events. Um, you'll see that there's um, some research that's the contrary to that and it's very well established in the clinical realm with a lot of medical doctors and cardiologists that aspirin not only thins blood but uh, there is some papers showing that it helps to prevent some inflammation on the inside of um, blood vessels. But we're going to talk about some of the other evidence there too so you're able to make a balanced decision and understand what's happening if you're taking repeated doses of aspirin in the body. So um, one of the things that happens with these is we have therapeutic doses, and these are the doses, when I talk about therapeutic doses, I'm talking about the doses that are occurring um, that should get prescribed by a medical physician. I'm not talking about um, ramping up over-the-counter doses, um, but that could certainly occur, and it does occur, and I see it frequently in practice, where somebody's buying over-the-counter ibuprofen or Aleve uh, or aspirin to numb the pain or influence the pain in a positive way so they feel better. And um, so therapeutic doses here, aspirin, um, it generally it varies among individuals depending on your size, but for an average 180 pound person, uh, you're looking at between um, 2,600 to 4,000 milligrams per day. For aspirin, you're looking at 800 to 3200 milligrams per day for ibuprofen and you're looking at 550 to 1650 milligrams per day for naproxen. Now one of the things we haven't talked about is what about acetaminophen, commonly known as Tylenol, is one of the main brands of that. This acts as a Antipyretic, which is a fancy name, meaning that it takes down temperature. It also acts as an anti-inflammatory. And uh, this is most studies on this will show um, 
that it has uh, some good effects of bringing down a temperature, also has some good effects as being an anti-inflammatory too. Um, and the therapeutic dose on uh, acetaminophen, um, I don't have that uh, readily available in my, in my head, um, uh, but we'll try and edit that out of this video, okay? Um, so going on to the side effects of these things, these are some of the things I want you to know. Between 10,000 and, and 20,000 deaths in the U.S. alone occur because of gastrointestinal, that's the, the, the big long tube that goes from the mouth all the way down to the intestines, bleeding. Um, it's very hard on the mucosal tissue. When I say mucosal tissue, I'm talking about the tissue that lines the esophagus and lines the stomach and the duodenum and the small intestine and the large intestine, which is uh, very similar to that of your mouth in some places. So just so you can get an idea for, for your own uh, understanding of what that might be like. And when these non anti-inflammatories or aspirins go in there, um, uh, it can thin the mucosal lining because it's very hard on them. And the risk of serious upper gastrointestinal bleeding, that's the upper gastrointestinal area right through here, is between 200 and 500% greater on the day that you're taking it than it is with a non-user. And this is according to a New, New England Journal of Medicine um, study done in 1999. This is huge news. And all of these figures do not include over-the-counter non anti-inflammatories. So we know it's a bigger problem. And the researchers, which were both PhD researchers here, they concluded that this is known as a silent epidemic. If you tabulated it all out, it would be the 15th most common cause of death in the United States. Something to think about. Uh, so so uh, another common one is an acceleration of bone destruction. Uh, we usually see this in the hips. The hips are some of the biggest weight-bearing joints. And when, and I see this clinically uh, over the last 20 years too, when we have somebody um, experiencing hip necrosis and may need a hip replacement, um, uh, oftentimes there's a big history of non anti-inflammatory use, only because they didn't know the side effects. Uh, they knew how it worked. Um, they didn't know it was inhibiting some of the good prostaglandins, and they were unaware of the um, ability to some of these drugs to have side effects on the body. Um, uh, so very common osteonecrosis of the hip usually involves having a hip replacement. Now one of the other, um, along a similar vein, one of the other side effects is the interruption of bone metabolism and cartilage repair. Um, in the mid to late 90s, uh, when glucosamine sulfate, which you've probably heard of, uh, came out as a natural alternative um, to some of these non steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, there was a lot of research going on studying uh, knee pain, and uh, specifically patella pain, which is the kneecap. And uh, this led to further studies on the spine and throughout other um, limbs. And one of the things that we get from that is that um, the glucosamine can, can decrease pain in extremities and sometimes in spinal joints. Um, but one of the big factors that you run into there is the fact that some people were taking non anti-inflammatories and taking glucosamine at the, at the same time. And there's many studies which show that the non anti-inflammatories, whether they're ibuprofen, whether they're aspirin, whether they're Aleve, whether they're naproxen, they inhibit the growth of baby chondrocytes, that's baby cartilage, maturing. So how do you get new bone to ma mature? You don't take these guys for a long period of time. Remember, when you're taking these, it should be for a short period to get you through a hump of, of very significant pain. Uh, for example, if you're in pain, you can't get to a chiropractor to get an adjustment. That's, that's one way to take some of these. Always take them on a, a stomach that's got some food in it, too. Don't do it on an empty stomach. That's going to help. 
Uh, another one is that we've already mentioned this, is that they inhibit the good fats, the omega-3s. You've all heard of fish oils, you've all heard of flaxseed oil, and you've all heard of linseed oil. These are essential fatty acids that the body doesn't make, so we need to get them from, from other uh, sources, both plant and animal sources. We need them both. And um, what happens is we get an imbalance when we take these guys because it knocks out the good fats, um, the bad fats like the um, omega-6s, uh, get out of balance. So we have this massive ratio of too many omega-6s and not enough omega-3s, and we get more inflammation in the body. And all the while we're taking these guys. Yeah, how does that work? Think about that. That's exactly how it works. This is another side effect. Unbalances the fatty acids that we need. What do we need fatty acids for? We need fatty acids for the brain. We need them for our adrenals. We need them for our sex hormones. We need them for our skin and hair. Um, good for us. Finally, and this is as a result of a huge population-based study in Finland, um, a, an increase in heart attack by 40% on the same day that you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And this is huge. And everybody... Um, uh, looked at this landmark study. They took everybody who went into an emergency room in Finland over a period of time, the whole population, and they looked what are the common factors for heart attacks. And one of the big things to come out of it was that those that had taken a non steroidal anti inflammatory uh, had had an increase in heart attack probability of 40%. Um, a serious risk to the population uh, was the conclusion. Uh, of the PhD and MD researchers involved in that study. And um, so, yeah, serious risk to people's health. If they're giving themselves an almost 50% chance of a heart attack on the same day they're taking it, even if they're just taking it for one day, um, if they're taking down some of the good fats, they're interrupting bone metabolism and they're irritating the GI path, you have to think about those in context of taking the pain down. Yes, they're helpful. Please do them for a short period of time. And we're going to talk about other alternatives to this that we use with success on a daily basis. Uh, stay tuned for that. Again, my name is Dr. Simon Agger. You've been listening to um, the nuts and bolts on non steroidal anti inflammatories. And uh, feel free to visit our website, look at our testimonials, and I'll be talking to you soon. Thank you very much.